all the good work that we've been doing has con on, on the ground conservation is now being undone by this huge rollout of renewables and it's off the charts. Um, I've got a background in cartography. I got an, have an associate diploma in cartography, which is map making. So I have a passion for maps. And as far as I know, we are the only organisation in Australia that is spatially mapping what is in the pipeline. So I'll just go through them. I, also, I currently work as a photographer. So for the last 20 years, I've worked, I've, I'm a freelance photographer. And I've run for the Greens. I was a member for the Greens. I was a founding member of the Far North Greens. I'm not anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll be helping my local LNP member, Bree James, in the upcoming state election. Um, so in 2017, I was in, employed by Ratch. It's a Thai company, big multinational company in North Queensland to photograph the construction of the Mount Emerald Wind Farm. Back at the time, back in 2016, 2017, I was a, a very big supporter of renewables. Um, I thought renewables were going to save us and I marched the streets for climate action. And <coughs> I was engaged in photographing the Mount Emerald Wind Farm. So what we've got here is one of the blades. This is a 57 metre long blade at 12 tonne. You can see the scale. I'm showing this, you this image to show you the scale. That is 57 metres. The new generation of wind farms going in at Moonlight Range, Mower Creek, Mount Fox, Upper Burdekin, um, Boulder Creek, Lotus Creek, Clark Creek, are around 89 metres long, twice that length. So they're twice as big. Sorry, and what height is the actual? Around 275 metres with the, the, with, the, um, turbo, with the blade vertically. So as you can see, a lot of um, road engineering needs to go in place to move and transport these huge pieces of, of, of componentry. The nacelle, for example, the actual centre gearbox is 400 tonne. That's just been recently blamed for the collapse of the Palmerston Highway in North Queensland after the recent rains. So they're now blaming the Caban Wind Farm for the collapse of that road because of all the heavy uh, truck movement on that road. That road has been out of action now for 50 days. So the whole agricultural industry is, is, is now have to uh, uh, bypass the, the Palmerston, adding a lot of costs. Um, so I know Mount, I used to know Mount Emerald really well. I bushwalked on the, uh, the Mount Emerald Plateau. It was a beautiful uh, plateau full of wildflowers. I walked up there many times with botanists, ecologists, family. It was one of the best hotspots for northern quolls in North Queensland, five endangered species, but I was happy to sacrifice that for renewable energy because that was going to save us. And the proponents were saying that this wind farm will provide power for 70,000 homes. And I thought, well, Cairns, which is my local suburb, is now carbon neutral. <laughs> so 70,000 homes, that's great. Okay, well, we'll sacrifice all this habitat for, um, for, for, for carbon neutrality. Um, so it was a beautiful place, Mount Emerald. Today it's an industrial complex. So it's a network of substations, transmission lines, roads. That's a bus. That's a big school bus to give you scale. The new generation of wind turbines, like we're seeing here in, on, in the central, in your area, twice the size of that. They're twice as big. The height. The height. Sorry. Well, not, not at the height, the actual, well, the blades. But they move those nacelles up and down depending on, on the geographic location. But what height are those actual turbine towers? Oh, I can't recall these ones. They're 57 metres. Yeah. Um, you're probably it's looking at 120... proposing over 300 metres. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, 300 metres is a new generation. Yeah. I believe that the wind industry is saying that... the, the, the they can't really exceed 100 metres. 100 metres engineeringly is as far as they can go in terms of length for blades. I don't... Okay, so this is Mount Emerald, okay? They're 185, Steve, from Google. Right, okay, 185 high. 185. This is what they do. Yeah, sorry I don't have sound there. We should have had sound. Yeah, so this was Mount Emerald. So this is green energy. So they. Is that? This is in 2017. This is a, Queensland's first industrial renewable uh, industrial wind farm. 
It's a wind factory. Wind factory, yes. Um, yeah, so I witnessed Mount Emerald and the destruction. I'll talk later about the actual efficiency of that wind factory, okay, later. A couple of years ago, I then heard of the Caban Wind Factory. So I went, and I knew that it's a brutal industry on the landscape. So I went down there and tried to photograph it before the bulldozers moved in. But the bulldozers had beat me to it. And they'd already cut the haulage roads through the forest. So what the wind factory, what the wind proponents are trying to do, what they want to do is try to get to the high elevation areas. There's no wind in Queensland except out west. You look at the wind modelling, which Twiggy Forest actually owns, because he bought Wind Lab, which was a CSIRO organisation. So when I spoke to Mick DeBrenny, the State Minister, I said, Mick, do you know if these are going in the right locations? Oh, well, we don't have the wind data because Twiggy owns it. <laughs> I said, well, you don't put in a coal mine if you don't know if there's bloody coal. But it's all about the subsidies and the certificates, and I'll talk about that later. It's not about the generation of electricity, it's the certificates. So, beautiful forest. I went in there, photographed it, photographed wildlife as the bulldozers were working this site. Um, yep, so you can see what they've done. Yeah, so... It, and, yeah, they just smash up the forest. Now, if this was a, an agricultural primary producer, there's no way they could get away with this. No sediment control, no erosion control, exempt from the Vegetation Management Act, exempt from the Nature Conservation Act, exempt from the reef regulations. This is, excuse me, just bullshit. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that's the, the clearing. Um, they've actually cleared another big chunk down onto this ridge here and blasted the top off that ridge. They, don't use, they didn't use dynamite on this project, but they used big civil engineering, civil earth moving um, construction. So all the knolls, the ridge lines, the ridge tops, the hilltops are just smashed, pulverised. So that's one hilltop there under construction at Caban. Yep, just pushing forest. And then this is a few months or about a, a couple of years later under construction. So that's that ridge line. No sediment control, no erosion, no nothing. Yep. And that's because they don't have to. They don't have to. There's no requirement. This is, this is a cowboy industry. Completely cowboy. Um, they're getting in as fast as they can because they know that they've got this tiny opportunity right now to get the DA in place, get the Indigenous Land Use Agreements if it's, for, if it's leasehold, get, uh, get the DA in place and then they can sit on it as a land bank with all the approvals and then if the coalition come in and change the rules, it doesn't matter, they've got the DAs in place. That's what they're doing. This is, this is one of the biggest land grabs in, in Australian history. Um, and they're just going hard and fast. And the state government are just flicking them through. They've not rejected one renewable project at all on environmental grounds. And these renewable projects are going into some of the best remnant forests left in Queensland. I can only speak for Queensland because this is a full-time job just keeping up with Queensland. Um, and I understand there's better wind resources in South Australia and so forth, and I'll talk about that later. Um, now, it's not necessarily about the clearing of forest, but it's the fragmentation of the forest. So it's pushing all these new haulage roads into forest areas. And what that does is um, introduce, there's weed incursions, altered fire regimes, and edge effects. So in an, an ecology context, once you push a road through, usually it's weeds that colonise the edge of the, the roads because they're open to light and then those weeds will penetrate into the forest for up to 200 metres, and that forest changes. So what we're seeing is not just the clearing of the roads, but we're seeing the edge effects of weed incursions and everything else that changes within that forest environment. <coughs> yeah, so you can see why they need to clear so much land to try to get those big components. 
Those blades there, they're 89 metres long to give you a sense of scale. 89 metres, they're 20 tonne. Like I said, those nacelle gearboxes up the top, those spindles, those gearboxes, they're around 400 tonne. They need to compact that pad really, really well to get the cranes in to lift those huge weights. So when they talk about decommissioning, it's a delusion. They cannot be decommissioned. And I was talking to someone in the wind industry down in New South Wales, and decommissioning is basically an oxy welder, oxy torch around the base, and just drop them down like trees. That's decommissioning. And I was naive to think, because they write in all their literature, in their proposals, oh, this decommissioning plan will, re re will you know, move all the components and recycle the parts. No, they don't. They're not going to spend a lot of money going in there, pulling all the components down piece by piece, getting cranes back in there. They're just going to drop it down by a tree, like a tree and maybe chop it up and try to move it that way or whatever. We don't know. It's never been done in Queensland or Australia. We don't know what decommissioning is. And, and the concrete foundations are immense. <coughs> um, that's just one of the cuttings at Caban. So this is, that's the amount of civil earth moving that goes into, into these things. So the wind industry want the high ridges, so therefore there needs to be a lot of civil earth moving to, to engineer the roads onto the right gradients to get those big components into these remote locations. And they're often remote wild locations that haven't been impacted upon. And it's those remote locations that have escaped high agriculture, uh, industry, urbanisation, because of their remoteness. And what size crane do they need? What tonnage is the crane to get in to repair? <coughs> Don't know. Would have to be huge. Yeah. So that's Caban now. So they're 250 tonne cranes that they use. There's a big company in central Queensland that is ramping up as we speak. Um, mm. They are investing in a crane that actually walks up the towers. Uh, it's an investment of some $12 million for one year. Hmm. Yeah, well, so we'll keep going, yeah. Because we've got limited... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, and then, you know, so not pe people aren't aware either that these turbines have lights. You know, so people, regional communities that, are, that enjoy the night sky at night and now in, 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 in an industrial complex with flashing lights at night because as the blades spin, they flash. I'll just go through this quickly. This is Shalumban. There's a video there, but I'll just move through that. So Shalumban is the next one that I found out, because I, I documented Mount Emerald, and then there was a caban, and you think, what's next? And then Shalumban. This is huge. So this is 94 turbines in the most beautiful wet sclerophyll forest of North Queensland. This is all going to get carved up into haulage roads and turbines. Plebisek is sitting on that decision right now. Yeah, so all this country carved up. Now, this is, these are the typical of the maps that the proponents give us. They're just diagrammetric maps like this. We can't do much with this. They call these roads tracks, dirt tracks. They're not. These are haulage roads. Up to 70 metres wide. At Shalumban, the roads are up to 70 metres wide when you take into account the cut and fill, the batters. <coughs> because I'm a cartographer, I do my own mapping. So that's an overlay of the Shalumban wind farm, wind factory site, hard up against the wet tropics ward heritage area. You wouldn't get, you wouldn't even... A grazier wouldn't be able to clear land up there. You wouldn't be able to cut, cut a fence line through there. But these mongrels can do whatever they like. So when we look at the topographic data, we can see that they're targeting all the ridge lines, the high elevation, the mountain tops, the places that have escaped industrialisation. <clears throat> and then we look at the contours, and we can see that we've got turbines going into 900 to 1,000 metre elevation range, really high elevation. And then we do a regional ecosystem overlay and we can see turbines are going into endangered ecosystems. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm involved, I've been involved in the conservation sector all my life and, and here I am fighting this, in, going into some of the best remnant forests left in, in, in Queensland and you go, what's going on so for renewable energy? And, and people are just, oh, that's no, renewable energy, it's fine. Oh, they're all really nice companies. They've got us, you know, they want to look after us in the climate. This is the forest they're going to cut up. 
So what's next? And then I thought, well, this is, in, this, is, this is only what I've discovered. I'll go and delve into what is happening in my neck of the woods in North Queensland between Ingham and Lakeland. And then I found all these projects. So 14,000 hectares of remnant forest to be cleared in North Queensland alone. So these two are completed. These are in the pipeline. Now we hear a lot of things about we hear our politicians, particularly Larissa Waters, talk about how good pumped hydro is. And on the face of it, it sort of sort of looks okay. You've got two retired pits, and you've got solar panels on a um, a tailings dam site, and it looks okay. The problem is, if you dig deeper, that's only stage one. Stage two is 1,400 hectares of solar panels to make it viable, and that's going to clear for me to forest. <laughs> which is a, <laughs> I've got to laugh because it's just so stupid. It's just delusional. So Kisden's great. Yeah, but, but. <laughs> um, this is another one that we found by stealth. The Mariba Shire Council had passed the Desailly Solar Farm. And I go through the Mariba Shire minutes every month. And I thought, I saw Desailly Solar Farm. What's that? I looked at it and there's like a hundred page document about this solar farm up in my neck of the woods, hard up against Brooklyn Nature Refuge. I take the kids camping on McLeod River. I know the area and there's no physical map in that 100 pages. No map. And the council, council CEO under delegated authority approved it. This is 2,400 hectares of savannah woodlands to be cleared. And one man, the CEO, approved it under delegated authority. Can I just ask, because I, I have to go. Yeah, yeah. This is fascinating. Yeah, it gets better. <laughs> yeah, I, I really wish I could, I could say that as a former Green, have you given this presentation to the Green? I've invited them here today, no response. I've got Larissa, I, I know Larissa Waters, I helped her, helped her get elected. Drove her around North Queensland and they just, their blinkers go on. Once I talk about bad renewables, They'll sit down and, oh yeah, that's bad, that's bad, but they won't lift a finger. Because their entire election, their entire election strategy is based on the fear of climate change, and I do believe in climate change. It's based on that, and that's the solution, vote for us. That's, that's their whole election strategy. You take away renewables as being bad, they've got no platform. That's my philosophy. That's, yeah, so this is Desali, 2,400 hectares to be cleared. I'll go through this quickly. This is Upper Burdekin. This is sitting in, on Plebisek's desk right now. She was supposed to make a decision last week. We hope that she's extended that decision. All that country there is going to go. This, this is the Upper Burdekin site. That's the Karma wind farm site in the distance. This is the Mount Fox volcanic crater, all that country around this beautiful volcanic crater, which is pristine, it's naturally cleared of vegetation. That's Twiggy Forest Project, Squadron Energy. He wrote a submission to that um, uh, conference the other day, whatever it's called. We read his letter, the squadron letter, saying that the EPBC process is taking too long for him to get onto this project. And this project, the, the endangered species list is mind blowing. They found a red goshawk, which is the holy grail of raptors in Australia. There's only a few of them left. <laughs> if it was a mine site, there's been mine sites in, North, in Cape York that have been knocked back because of the red goshawk. There was one found here and we're waiting for Plebisek to make an announcement if she's going to approve it. So she's... <laughs> Shaman rock wallabies, endangered, all through the site. I've camped on the site. I photographed koalas. That's on a haulage road alignment. The koala is on the haulage road alignment. Rufus bedongs, wedge tail eagles. There's rock art in the gorges. The Gugu Baden, the indigenous people up there, they signed the Iliwa, with, with Twiggy Forest before doing a cultural heritage survey of that area. I believe there's more rock art sites on that property. There's three gorge systems on that property 
and the Gugu Baden have signed an Iliwa with Twiggy before doing a cultural survey. We don't even know what's on the site yet, and they've, they've, and they've signed, signed it away. That's the scale of it. Um, to give you an idea, that's an overlay over the city of Cairns. So that's the footprint of all the haulage roads of the Upper Burdekin Wind Farm factory overlaid this over the city of Cairns to give you a sense of scale. It's enormous. Yeah, what's the size and capacity of that project? I can't remember. No. Yeah, so Boulder feels like that to be blasted out. This, that's the Upper Burdekin Wind Farm site. It's now been renamed. It's like Adani was rebranded as whatever it is now. Bravis. Bravis. Yeah. Upper Burdekin Wind Farm, fact, fact, Wind Farm has been now rebranded as um, Gamara Wara or something, as an Aboriginal name. So it's trying to deflect us as activists to make it sound like it's got Aboriginal consent and all this and it's all lovely and rosy and it's all nice and green. This site here was earmarked to be the next, next national park acquisition in Queensland. So national parks bought Waruna Station, Oak Hills. They were about to buy this property next because of its high biodiversity. Shaman rock wallabies, red goshawks, rufous bedongs, koalas. Um, but Twiggy Forest got it first and now it's gone. We can't, we can't get it. So why here? So I had to wonder why are they doing this? Why, why are they concentrating all these projects in these locations? Yeah, I'm <laughs> Well, it's all about the transmission lines. So then I started to map where these projects are going. So you can see here, you've got Mount Emerald, Caban, Desailly, which is on the Cooktown line, Shalumban, <coughs> Upper Burdekin, Mount Fox. Now we now know that there's the Karma wind farm in here. And we just found out yesterday, which really breaks my heart, there's another wind factory going in here called Hidden Valley. And that is well advanced. And the neighbours down there, the residents have been calling me, hey Steve, what do you know about Hidden Valley? We think it's going to go as a wind farm. And I said, I don't know, I don't have any evidence. We can't find anything. Yesterday, I accidentally found the website and there it is, Hidden Valley Wind, wind, Energy, wind Energy Park. And they're saying on the website, it's well advanced, you know, <laughs> like it's a done deal. So they've already been doing deals with state government and we're in the conservation sector and we didn't even know that this is in the pipeline and it's well advanced. It breaks my heart. Hidden Valley was, used to be run by a, a wonderful couple, um, an ecotourism venture with cabins. It's now going to be, and they sold out to the Lolo brothers who got the heads up that it could be a wind resource there and they bought it. So what I did then was try to map or understand what, what is happening across Queensland. This was just happening in my neck of the woods in North Queensland. So then people like Glen and other communities all across the state are saying what's happening in South East Queensland or Central Queensland. Sorry. So then I tried, well we tried to map all of the projects. Now this is a, not a complete collection of projects. Like I said, we just found another project yesterday, so we're up to 110. I'd say we're, there's more than that in the pipeline, 111, 112. A few of these have been completed, like Mount Emerald, um, Caban. These are mostly projects under in the pipeline. How does that look in a spatial footprint? Well, there it is. So all those red lines are the, the footprints for wind factories in Queensland. You can see how they hug the transmission lines, um, which unfortunately hug the Great Dividing Range. Um, these are two bombshells. That's the Proserpine Wind Farm and the um, Yungala Wind Farm. They're, they're bombshells because they're in beautiful forest, hard up against Yungala National Park. And the people down at Proserpine and Yungala are none the wiser. They don't know. But I know there's wind, Eperon and Arc Energy, they're in there now doing bloody wind monitoring. So let's just focus between Rockhampton and Gladstone. So let's just zoom in. This is what's happening in that small area, in Collins area, and Glen's area. 
these are all, so you can see they're grabbing all the land that's at high elevation, that's near a transmission line, that's outside of a national park in a state forest. And they're just grabbing the lot. <laughs> so I've got to laugh. So this is, the, this is what's happened in central Queensland. Gladstone to Rockhampton. Clark Creek. That's under construction. I'll talk about that quickly. Clark Creek, that's Twiggy Forest. Lotus Creek. Um, Chris Bowen gets elected. When was that? A year ago? Two years ago? And then it just goes nuts. Yeah, it just goes on and on. And that's, that's the current state of play right now. So that's the footprint. <laughs> so I've got to lie. <laughs> that's the footprint of crap renewables in your neck of the woods and no one knows about it. It's the biggest... <laughs> it's a complete scam. Mount Hopeful Wind Farm. I ground truth that. So I've ground truthed well, Mower Creek, Boulder Creek, a little bit of um, upper uh, Mount Hopeful, Clark Creek, Lotus Creek. So I go and I've driven the coastal ranges and I've ground truthed a lot of these projects. And they're all really good pieces of forest <laughs> that's going to get destroyed. There's yellow belly gliders in the Mount Hopeful wind farm, wind factory site. Yellow belly gliders. And they're going to put a wind factory in there. <laughs> We're trying to save yellow belly gliders in North Queensland because they're endangered. <laughs> um, to give you an idea, this is the Clark Creek footprint. And then I do the regional ecosystem overlay. And we've got turbines going into of concern vegetation. All this white area is cleared land. So that's cleared, that's forest. Green is remnant, yellow's of concern. A purple is endangered subdominant and dark purple is endangered dominant. We've got turbines going into of concern. Imagine doing that if you're a primary producer <laughs> or, or anything. And not one submission was lodged with the Federal Environment Minister from a conservation group. This was before our time. We didn't know this was going. <coughs> not one submission. Where's ACF? Where's EDO? <laughs> That's the site now. So I camped on the Clark Creek site, saw koalas, and they're just smashing the forest up. Haulage roads, no sediment control, no erosion control, everything just gets pushed over into the gullies. Warren, how are you? How are you? Good. Yeah, everything just pushed into the gullies. No sediment, no erosion, nothing. Steve. Yes. Could you put to see you just because Warren's here now? Yes. Could you just quickly go, unless he's seen it already? No. Our slide. The, the progression. Yeah, yeah. Outlay of what's happened. Um, or go back to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great, Warren. Yeah. So what we've done is actually document all the renewable projects in Queensland. Okay, the state government won't do this because they know that we'll be completely alarmed and that the, the, the state you know, <coughs> residents will just go nuts. So we've mapped them. These are all the projects in the pipeline. There's a couple there that, are, that have been constructed, such as Mount Emerald and Caban. We've now got, I was just saying, Warren, I just found that Mount um, Hidden Valley near behind Mount Fox is now going to be a wind factory. Just found that out yesterday. That's, and it's well advanced. No one knows about it. There's a rally in Ingham next Saturday because now they're getting hit up with the Mount Fox Energy Park, the Karma Wind Factory, the Upper Burdekin Wind Factory, and now the Hidden Valley Wind Factory, all up there. That's all going. So we're up to 110 projects in the pipeline. Now, how does that look as a spatial footprint for Queensland? So you can see what's happening. The entire Great Dividing Range is going to go. So all those red lines are the haulage roads. Um, and. Uh, and unfortunately, the high voltage transmission lines sort of hug the Great Dividing Range as well. So that's why they want to be there. Now, it's not necessarily about wind. It's all about the certificates, and I'll talk about that later. Um, so, how does, so how does, if we look at just the area between Gladstone and Rockhampton, for example, 
what we're seeing are all the wind factories occupying all the high elevation areas outside of state forests and national parks. It's the biggest wind grab, wind, uh, land grab that, that we'll ever see. It's massive. Vast amounts of country are going to go under renewables. So I, did a, uh, so I mapped a sequence, I did it sequentially, of what's going on. Clark Creek, which is under construction now, that's a Twiggy Forest project. That's Clark Creek. Lotus Creek. Clark Creek was approved under the previous government and Lotus Creek. But then Bowen got elected, or Albanese. The very next day, it was a, a free-for-all. And this has all happened in the last year. So we've got these wind factories just going flat strap. And it goes on and on. And that's the current state of play. And there's most likely other projects. We don't know about them. These developers are so sneaky. And they'll go in there, they'll secure the land with agreements. They'll stitch up Indigenous, if it's leasehold, Indigenous land use agreements. They'll stitch it all up and then they'll have a token community consultation, which is a sham, a complete sham. And, uh, and it, yeah, anyway. Um, I just want to go back to that. This here, uh, up at Calope Solar Park, Calliope, over a million panels, one million panels. Its, What's foot, it? its footprint is just short of 15,000 acres. That's 5,000 hectares. 5,000 hectares under glass. So I can't even imagine that. 5,000 hectares under glass. Okay, I'll just go through this quickly because I've already shown the audience this. Oh, this is, so this is Clark Creek. So I went there, camped there, photographed the koalas and, all, and everything there. It's huge amounts of civil earth moving. Lotus Creek breaks my heart. This is an absolute criminal project. It should never have got up. So like I was saying, white is cleared land, green is remnant, purples are, rem are endangered, sub subdominant. We are waiting for the bulldozers to go in there any day. I've got landowners down there ready to call me when they start seeing bulldozers. All those hills you see there, completely dynamited out, cleared, smashed. That's going to get smashed, big causeway over here somehow, cut up the hill and then this granite ridge line, three turbines and everything, all that smashed, completely annihilated. This should be the great koala koala park for Queensland. I've never seen so many koalas in my life. The density of koalas. In the environmental report for this project, they found 101 koalas, many with joeys on the back, and 138 greater gliders within the project footprint. Unheard of densities, unheard of. And dozers are going in there any day now. So then I mapped with my cartographic background, I mapped where the roads are going across all the ridge lines. Those black dots are where the turbines are going on that photograph. That's smashed. It's gone. Then we look at Boomer Range, and you can see again we've got turbines going into of concern vegetation. This is if you're a primary producer, there's no way you'd be able to get get a, you'd be able to do this. Absolutely insane. Um, Glenn's country. So I, I was fortunate to go down and meet Glenn and Glenn took me up in a chopper. We can see turbines going through remnant. That's the country from the air. So what we're seeing here are turbines placed on these ridge lines. Glenn knows his country intimately, third generation. Completely annihilated, smashed. You're going to be surrounded by turbines. Well, I think how many? 22 renewable projects in your shire alone. Yeah, yeah, no, there's uh, yeah, 11. Yeah. 11, 11 big oh, yeah. wind factories, yeah. So just going back to these 110 projects, okay? So it made me think, well, where's the end game? This is what scares me the most. Where is the end point? There's no end point. Because we talk about hydrogen, energy superpower. So then I did some sums. 
So with those 110 projects, that will deliver at nameplate capacity if every single turbine was going flat strap, 22 gigawatt of power. Queensland needs 13,000 or 13 gigawatts. We've just hit 13 the other day, highest, the highest generation in history just a couple of weeks ago with that heat wave. Because renewable power only generates 15 to 35% uh, efficiency, um, so let's assume a 25% capacity factor, which is quite generous because Mount Emerald actually generates 18%. It, that, that would only generate five, five gigawatt. So we need to times that by three, roughly. So at least three. So all those projects you saw in Queensland, that 110 projects, we need to times that by three to try to give us baseload power for this state. <laughs> and I mean try because it's still a delusion, you can't do it. But this also excludes all the critical mineral mining, the transmission infrastructure, the substations, the firming of the system, all the other stuff. And you need to back it all up with gas peaking plants when it fails. So I've added up, there's around 5,200 turbines in the pipeline for Queensland right now with those 110 projects. The total to be cleared, like physically, for, for footprints of these renewable projects is 57,000 hectares of classified remnant and some non-remnant. That's how much land is to be cleared for those 110 projects in the pipeline. Now the State Energy and Jobs Plan says that we need 600,000 hectares of land for 10 gigawatt, but running at 15 to 30% capacity factor, we need to times that by three so we need about 1.8 million hectares of land in Queensland to cover in glass and steel. To go all electric transport, we'll then need to triple our current generation. Elon Musk says we need to triple our generation if every one of us, if the 1.49 billion vehicles on Earth are to be converted to electric, we need to triple energy generation. If we want redundancy in the system, double that again. If we, if we talk about a hydrogen superpower, we need to double that again. And if we're talking about it being a global world exporter of green energy, which I've got no idea what the definition of that is, we'll then double or triple that again. Now, the Net Zero report, which is a great report, re um, released last year, and that was um, endorsed by the Australian Conservation Foundation, says that to do that, just to get, just to, get to our baseload capacity to power, just to get to carbon neutrality in Australia, we need to spend 1.5 trillion by 2030 and five to seven to nine trillion dollars by 2060, 36 years away. Complete delusion. Why? So why do we need so much of this stuff? Why do we need so much renewables and so many wind farms? Why do we need 110? But we need to times that by three. So we actually need 300 renewable projects in Queensland. It's because of this. And this is why power prices will never, ever, ever, ever go down. So Mount Emerald, for the year 2022, this is all publicly available data, so I graphed it. For over 100 days in 2022, the number of days of generation was less than 10 megawatt. Completely dismal. So the median capacity factor for Mount Emerald is 18%. So it's, it has a, has a 180 megawatt nameplate capacity, but it only runs at 18%. For 182 days, the generators produce less than 32 megawatts. Um, for 63 days, Mount Emerald produced zero. That's why we need to overbuild everything. That's why we need redundancy. We need 300 wind farms in Queensland because if the wind's not blowing, that needs to be blowing somewhere else. But we've just seen in Queensland, where the last week, where wind has been blowing nowhere. I was going to say, Steve, a lot of people do that pure mathematical nameplate capacity yeah. calculation. But even if you did triple or quadruple or quintuple mm. the amount, when there's an East Coast low, yep. the whole, everything's out. Yep. And that happens heaps of times. Oh, no. Yeah, it's just yeah, madness. So then I dug up what, so Ratch is the proponent of Mount Emerald. They're now listed as one of, one of Australia's 100 top businesses that pay no tax. Um, so last year, $161 million they made. <laughs> the, 
They've got other wind farms, and they've got Mount Emerald that doesn't deliver any meaningful electricity. And they made $161 million. That's why power prices will never, ever, ever, ever go down. Hydrogen blows my brain. Um, I'll just, that's, this is a, there's three of these projects proposed up the west coast of WA. 700 turbines, um, over 50,000 hectares. Uh, 10,000 hectares of solar panels. And then they need to dredge out a port and ship out the product, ammonia or whatever. Complete delusion. So if the wind doesn't blow, they don't produce ammonia. When the wind blows, they produce <laughs> hydrogen. <laughs> and people fall for it. It's a delusion. So this is um, Murchison National Park. That horizon will be wind turbines if that project goes ahead. So my thoughts are, should we be clearing and fragmenting forests for renewables? Are we going down the wrong path that has failed everywhere else? Where is our model for 100% renewables? There is no model. And which countries are carbon free? And I believe that there is a climate emergency, but 100% renewables is not the solution. And, you know, I'm not an energy expert. I had no interest in energy up until three years ago. And I'm, I'm still learning. But where the point in where I've come to is that there's good renewables. There's rooftop solar. There's small community grids. There are wind farms that have social licence and, um, you know, and, and I've come to the realisation that nuclear is going to be a part of our solution. It has to be. And I was very anti-nuclear. Uh, and I was brainwashed by the Friends of the Earth and the Australian Conservation Foundation and Greenpeace. Completely brainwashed by their ideology and, and rubbish. And when you put that ideology aside and you look at nuclear, nuclear is a no-brainer. And it breaks my heart to see so much country being destroyed when we can just go down that nuclear path. Yeah. Um, and I agree that I'm, I'm really rushing this. I agree that nuclear is depicted in the media. You know, it's, this is going to be filmed. So if you watch a YouTube video, just pause it on this slide. <laughs> um, and then when you dig down into nuclear, James Hansen, the first fellow who addressed climate change to the US Senate, he's a very big advocate for nuclear. The Dalai Lama is an advocate for nuclear. He understands the spatial footprint required for renewables. James Lovelock, the author of the Gaia Hypothesis, the, 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 um, you know, the, the Ayatollah of the conservation movement, he, <laughs> nuclear is the only green solution. Dick Smith, and I dug into Dick Smith's background. Dick Smith to me is a hero, but I, I found that he was one of the only people that fought or stood up publicly against the Mount Ember wind farm. I was saying at the start of the show that I was very for the, the wind farm. This is what we need to do to transition. But it doesn't deliver anything, nothing meaningful. And Dick Smith was out there on radio saying Mount Ember wind farm is a waste of time. It's, 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 it's meaningless electricity generation. We've just got to go nuclear. Bill Gates is a big advocate of nuclear. And even our professor, Bill Lawrence, up at JCU, he drafted up an open letter to environmentalists around the world, signed by 100 leading environmentalists, urging governments to re-look at nuclear. Because they all know, ecologists know, the spatial footprint of renewables and the fragmentation of forests. Nuclear is a small footprint. Nuclear must be part of our solution. It eliminates the need for new transmission lines. Um, firming, batteries, it has a tiny footprint, 18 hectares for, 40, for, for, for 400 megawatt. Um, recent polling indicates that 61% of Australians are in favour of further investment in nuclear. Um, and I see a logical solution is when coal-fired power stations reach their retirement age, there needs to be a transition over to nuclear. And that planning must, meet, must, must come now. Um, I believe we need a fast transition of fossil fuels and renewables can help. But 100% renewables require more materials and minerals, a physical, lawn, uh, physical land footprint that is incomprehensible and is far more expensive than nuclear as demonstrated in other countries. And it's not hard to find that data online that nuclear uh, delivers the cheapest power on earth uh, behind, behind hydro. 
Um, these are examples. Washington, they've just announced 12 100 megawatt SMRs to be installed. Canada, Rolls Royce are going hard in England. Poland's going nuclear. The UA UAE, South Africa's going nuclear. Jap Japan is doubling down on their nuclear fleet. India have understood that renewables are a waste of time. They're going to bypass renewables and go straight to nuclear. And China are building, they've just ramped up from 10 to 12 reactors a year, the starting of construction, 12 a year. Yeah, so I think you'll find over time that more people like myself will, will move over to nuclear and we just need that to happen faster, more quicker than we need it to happen quicker. I know you're, you're itching to go. Yeah, so thank you. Well, thank you. This is, this is the last three days, Mount Emerald and Caban. I just did this last night at midnight last night. I did a screenshot for the power output for Caban Wind Farm and Caban Wind Factory. It delivered no meaningful electricity in the last three days in North Queensland. Exactly. And these guys are making trillions. Caban is an Eowyn, French-owned multinational company that sucked up to the state government and Palaszczuk gave them a $40 million interest-free loan to get that project up. A multinational company and we as taxpayers have propped it up and it delivers no electricity. Thank you. Good on.